Well, thank you for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Uh, Jim Wetzel and I are kindred spirits, so every kind thing he says uh, about me reflects on him. So, um, <laughs> you know, ad infinitum. Um, um, I want to start with um, asking for your uh, clemency and patience. Uh, of course, you're free to leave uh, any moment. But um, according to the passage uh, Jim read, uh, my work is indeed or on about slowness and uh, circumventions, detours, retardations. So if you sit down and you uh, wonder what, what that kind is this kind of talking about, and does he ever get make it to Augustine? Again, be patient, I'll get there. But it takes time. Another th um, preliminary remark is that uh, my lecture will be n not be focusing directly on the religious aspects of uh, confessions, uh, whereas, of course, it is a religious book. But um, I, being <laughs> at a Catholic in institution, I, I wouldn't want to make the impression that I consider uh, the Confessions and the work of Augustine in general as uh, to be secularized. You know, I don't believe in this, uh, this uh, distinction between religion and, and the secular uh, approach. So, so if I'm not talking uh, directly about religion, I'm talking about religion. I wanted to say that. <coughs> and last but not least, I want to uh, thank the Augustinian uh, uh, Institute for, for, the, for this hospitality, Father Fitzgerald and Anna and uh, Jim Wetzel. I have a marvelous time here. And I hope this evening won't spo spoil it for you. Sometimes, even detectives do stupid things. Thus, in the episode in Masonic Mysteries of the series Inspector Morse, our detective, who, like most, if not all detectives, lives a semi-celibate life, in this case trading the vacancy of partnership for his love of classical music, takes a would-be girlfriend to the weekly rehearsal of his choir. While rehearsing Mozart, uh, the magic flute, he hears through the sound of music, someone scream in the adjacent room. He runs into it only to find the lifeless body of the girlfriend. In a reflex, he takes up the knife lying next to the body, thereby making himself complicit in the crime. After the arrival of his colleagues, he leaves the room and sits despondently at the foot of the staircase, battered to the point of inward paralysis by the nightmare of unprofessionalism come true. He remotely hears some ladies on the way out of the building wishing him good night, to which he distractedly replies muttering to himself rather than to the ladies already out of sight. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Foolishly, when watching this episode many years ago, I prided myself on knowing the origin of, of this lie. It was T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, whereas I was to learn much later that Eliot is quoting Ophelius, Ophelius' last words in Shakespeare's Hamlet. After a sing-song of incomprehensible verse, all of which suggests madness to the bystanders, Ophelia whispers before leaving the scene and subsequently drowning herself, good night, ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night, good night. Serendipity, uh, serendipity notwithstanding, 
in this threefold appearance of good night ladies, three moments converge in bringing out one shared moment of what I would like to call absorption, a concept that will prove eminently suitable to characterize Augustine's language in Confessions. And it is this moment of absorption that my title, Inside Augustine, is supposed to suggest. By taking this notion as my own poetical tool to get inside confessions, my aim is, by way of experiment, to temporarily bracket common descriptions of confessions and replace them in a shock and an operation of sorts by little bombshells borrowed from fully un augustinian semantic fields. Once triggered, they will reveal a slimmer and rejuvenated shape of a book whose form and size has grown out of proportion. And now I will list uh, briefly the, uh, say, the usual themes discussed when reading uh, uh, confessions and the common uh, communist opinion that, uh, uh, about uh, as to the theme, the major themes of the confessions. Uh, uh, confessions is a conversion story. Confessions an autobiography. Confessions is uh, represents a move from extraversion to introspection, and confessions uh, is uh, a. Uh, um, a rendering of the Christian meaning of fe confessio in Latin, a confessio of sin, faith, and praise. All those, uh, all those themes are, are utterly true, but it is not always clear how they uh, cohere, and if there is any coherence at all, or whether that coherence is imposed from the outside. In order to get to the promised fresh characterization of confessions, we have to make quite a detour, one which we in fact started already with Inspector Moses Bafflement. What then do I mean by the three appearances of the good night ladies converging? First of all, first, all three of them are epiphanic moments of time. Second, these moments are processed through memory. And third, their combined appearance can be called absorption and immersion, literally so in Ophelia's case. Let us first have a look at most. Apart from being a playful insertion by the writers, or the writer, I didn't see the book by Colin Dexter, of the series, showing off their knowledge of Shakespeare and or Eliot, the scene is arresting, not for the intertextuality about which I couldn't care less, but for its extreme, unexpected subtlety within the straightforward and unambiguous literary parameters of the detective genre. This still moment of pause in the midst of the hectic business of solving crimes draws the viewer's attention to a man talking to himself in a soliloquy of sorts that absorbs in the process the initial response to floating goodnight wishes from outside. Another subtlety. The memorial muttering is twofold. We observe most distractedly, yet almost effortlessly, lifting the sweet ladies out of the depths of his traumatized mind, while at the same time making an outward appeal to the co cognizant viewer to catch the emotional effect, the epiphany of this memorial moment. I myself am a case in point. Being hopeless at remembering plot, the scene has long stu since stuck in my mind. With Eliot's Good Night Ladies, we squarely remain with the realm within the realm of absorption. Among the many things the wasteland is taken to mean, its scattered speech stands out. Throughout the poem, we hear voices whose speaking subjects are far from fixed or even present, or rather, at once present and absent, 
and for that reason seemingly free floating while being interspersed with hints, clues and sounds delivered by other voices up in the air. If it corresponds to anything, it is Shusterwinski's The Rite of Spring, which with its fast changing rhythms and its scattered references to Russian folk music. Yet, for all the similarities, there is a basic difference in the shape of the loud and relentless outward drive of Stravinsky's music versus the delicate withdrawn movements of Eliot's halting words. Absorption versus theatricality. It is in that vein that we come across his good night ladies. Preceded by an oblique reference to Shakespeare, uh, quote, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag, which in fact refers to a well-known popular song, the passage ends like Moses dreamingly, the words eventually fading into night. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Tata. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. Time and memory, in the guise of the night language of absorption, take us back to Augustine. In the meantime, we have learned that after Morse and Eliot, it is not so easy to leave the realm of epiphany and poetry. What about Augustine? To answer that question, Eliot is quite willing to help us out. Within the scattered and absorptive language of the wasteland, Augustine too makes his appearance. Lala. To Carthage, then I came, burning, 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 burning. O Lord, thou pluckest me out. O Lord, thou pluckest burning. Fini Carthaginum. To Carthage, I came. Those are the opening, uh, the opening words of Book Three of Confessions which tells us how Augustine moved from the provincial Augusti to the capital Carthage, just like an aspiring 19th century young Frenchman with a dime to spare, or for that matter penniless, would move from his provincial native town to Paris, the city of lust and pleasure. I came to Carthage, and all around me hissed the cauldron of illicit love. As yet, I had never been in love, and I longed to love. And from a subconscious poverty of mind, I hated the thought of being less inwardly destitute. I thought an object for my love. I was in love with love, and I hated safety and a path free of snares. Although the gist of my lecture is and remains to question the latter, Elias Augustine pretty much seems to accurately re reflect confessions to the latter. With his two cartridges I came. And still to the latter, but more ambivalently, with the burning, which at once may mean burning with lust and burning with the desire to love God. I quote, my God, how I burned, how I burned with longing to leave earthly things and fly back to you." End quote. There is a sense in which Eliot could look like spanning with a stroke of genius the entire arc of confessions by moving from the ambiguous burning to divine predilection or predestination with the, O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out. But alas, this sounds too good to be true. If we take a closer look at Eliot, we have to admit that what looks like an arc breaks down on the spot. The fourfold burning is telling us this already. Like the fourfold good night ladies, it is up in the air. 
Next, following the breakdown, the personal nature of thou pluckest me out is diminished into a minimal, or for that matter, widened out into a general thou pluckest, only to be finished off with another floating turning, almost finally so in its suspense. No longer is there an arc in sight. The next question we face is, of course, whether what holds true for Eliot also holds true for Augustine. In my view, it does. Just as Eliot doesn't leave for one moment the poetry of absorption, so Augustine, in opening a new chapter with two cartridges I came, doesn't for one moment leave the language of absorptive soliloquy, which implies that there is no moment at which he can be caught telling the bare facts. To get a bit better grip on this problem, we have to be more precise about the meaning of absorption and soliloquy. Thus far, I've used the two concepts more or less interchangeably, although the one seems to express a state and the other a flow. At first glance, absorption would look more pictorial, while soliloquy is by definition concerned with sound. True enough, a painting can't be a soliloquy, and vice versa. Yet, they do converge in being capable of pulling off the act of turning inwards, which, be it vision of or sound, ignores or cuts off the spectator alias reader. They are on their own, up in the air. If that is indeed the case, Augustine's opening statement in Book 3, To Cartridge I Came, can no longer be read as a merely historical or narrative communication. In one way or another, it should be assessed as be being part of what I would like to coin as free indirect speech, floating speech. That is, the peculiar language of Augustine's Confessions, in which he paradoxically applies the full arsenal of his rhetorical skills in addressing the reader, while at the same time changing that mode of address by ignoring the latter in favor of his self-created absorption and immersion in catching his confessee. Consequently, if the reader hears or reads anything, it, and here the visual comes in, takes on the shape of observing and witnessing the spectacle of the confessor confessing, just as we have dimly seen and heard Inspector Morse talking to himself, the scattered voices of the wasteland talking to each other, and Ophelia immersing herself in sing-song. As for soliloquy, the literary critic James Wood has explicitly, explicitly linked it, as it should be, to memory as it manifests itself in the simultaneity of absent-mindedness and present-mindedness. Wood calls this the mnemonic paradox of redundancy, in which we have unnaturally to work at what we would naturally remember in order to learn something new. Clearly, this ongoing tension between remembering and forgetting wipes out any sequential or causal temporal narration as in the factual reading of two cartridges I came. Instead, the confessing mind is fully engaged in the mnemonic act, a double act in fact, of both searching to remember and staging itself as searching to remember. A process that, according to Woods, finds its origin, origin in dramatic soliloquy, whose origins lie in prayer. Thus, the confessional presence is persistent. I quote, Inasmuch as Shakespeare's soliloquies are addressed to the audience, we become God by proxy, the Delphic oracle that never replies. Soliloquy may be seen, then, not merely as an address, but as a speech with an inter interlocutor who doesn't respond, a blocked conversation and blocked intention. Again, this may flow from the frustration of wishes, 
For merely to speak to God is to be frustrated by his silence. This aspect of prayerful consciousness is obviously present in the novel in the form of epiphany and the solitary fantasy. What is Proust's motherland but a secularized communion wafer, the host by which the worshiper begins to examine himself? As for absorption, at first sight its visual nature would seem markedly different from soliloquy. Yet in my view, the opposite holds true, and this becomes immediately clear if we look at Inspector Morse's muttering good night ladies, the muttering as it were being absorbed by, by the picture or vice versa. The difference no longer matters. And though it may be true that in many an absorptive painting, we see people often dumbstruck or on the brink of speaking or indeed speaking for what it is worth, so is Inspector Moss, and so is Elliot, all the way through the wasteland, and so is the confessing Augustine. It is the art critic and art historian Michael Fried who has published widely on the theme of absorption and its counterpart, theatricality. Initially, Fried developed his theory based on art criticism in a specific historical period, the 18th century, and a specific view on the matter, that of Diderot, in particular the latter's abhorrence of theatricality. Conversely, absorption as such, as Fried admits, has an older history and a longer afterlife. This is not, however, the place to get to the intricacies of the problems, which are, are many, I can assure you. For my argument, it may suffice that both absorption and theatricality are in play regardless of any period, and certainly so in Augustine. But let us first listen to what Fried himself has to say about absorption. The Diderotian easel painting or tableau seeks crucially to establish the supreme fiction or ontological illusion that the beholder doesn't exist, that there is no one standing before the canvas. It does this principally in two ways, through the persuasive representation of figures so deeply absorbed in what they are doing, feeling, and thinking that they appear oblivious to anything else, including the beholder's presence before the canvas, and by means of an ideal of, of pictorial unity, according to which all elements in the painting are perceived as motivated by a single dramatic imperative, one might say as absorbed or in or by that imperative, so that the beholder instinctively feels that they can't be other than as they are. The tableau is concerned solely with its own internal necessities, devoid of the least hint of theatricality. At the same time, equally crucially, the tableau's thematic and composi compositional closure upon itself is understood as arresting the actual beholder before the work, and indeed as transfixing him or her with a new intensity. The tension between these linked imperatives at once to deny and thereby to trans transfix the beholder is in the end unresolvable. In contrast to a painting being closed in on itself, stands the move outward to the theatricality. The, uh, the theatricality the Diderot retested, whether in drama or painting. As Fried puts it, I quote, in Diderot's writings on painting and drama, the object behold the relationship as such, the very condition of spectatordom, stands indicted as theatrical, a medium of dislocation and uh, estrangement rather than of absorption, sympathy, self-transcendence. And now I shall show you some slides, uh, both about um, absorption and theatricality. And uh, they are not all 18th century, but my main focus is on absorption and a, and a uh, very good counterexample. First, this one, Saint uh, Augustin Pression de Van Valère, uh, Augustine preaching before uh, the Bishop uh, Valerius in Hippo. And you see that all the 
the figures, in no one, no person in, in the painting is looking outside. And they're all absorbed in the preaching of Augustine. Uh, and this fellow, the, 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 the scribe, you know, is absorbed in, in writing the sermon down. And uh, that fellow looking in, in the book, you know, even reinforces the notion of uh, no one looking outwards. The following is this one. That's the, the famous nights, uh, night watch in the Rijks Museum. And well, President Obama came to, uh, to see the museum. And a very smart uh, dir uh, director of the museum managed to get him in front of the night watch. But this one is theatrical to the core because all the people walk out of the painting. And that is only reinforced by putting uh, President Obama in front of that painting, not looking at it, but also walking out, so to speak. So that uh, would be called theatrical by Diderot and by um, uh, Fried. The last one is the opposite, also a painting by Rembrandt, an old woman meditating, that's a woman reading her Bible. And you see she's absorbed in her uh, reading. On a basic level, it would not be hard to point to numerous absorptive scenes in Confessions. Augustine's useful learning the meaning of words by intensely and watchfully figuring out how, in adult speech, sound and body language interact. Augustine watching Ambrose being immersed in silent reading, a double absorption. Augustine absorbed by inner turmoil in the Milan Garden. Augustine drawn almost into the Esse Ipsum during the vision at Ostia. Augustine grief-stricken at Monica's death, but suppressing his tears with the help of those shared by his son, thus replacing his voice with the fox Puri, the, the voice of his, the boy, inverted absorption. Augustine sitting in his room in Book 10, absorbed again in musing, musings about his failed conversion. By Augustinian absorption, I do, however, mean more than these things. It is the very language of confessions itself that is comprehensively closed in on itself, motivated by a single dramatic imperative, concerned solely with its own internal necessities, and as such, devoid of the least hint of theatricality. In the following, I propose to track Fried-like traces of absorption in two passages from Confessions. First, Augustine's agony preceding his conversion, and second, the famous scene of Olympias' absorption in the theater. In discussing Augustine's agony, I call in Fried's help in order to deal with the question whether the wildness of agony so vividly described by Augustine can still be categorized as absorption? Or should we brandish it, as we, uh, would seem the case at first sight, as sheer theatricality? What about Augustine's language in this respect? I quote, finally, in the agony of hesitation, I made many physical gestures of the kind men make when they wanted to achieve something and lack the strength. If I tore my hair, if I struck my forehead, if I intertwined my fingers and clasped my knee, I did that to do so was my be because to do so was my will. End quote. Well, that's pretty theatrical, it would seem. All this is a prelude leading up to the well-known analysis of different wills that scatter the willing person to the point of his being neither wholly willing nor wholly unwilling. So I was in conflict with myself and was dissociated from myself. Now, where I need free support is in pointing out that appearances notwithstanding, absorption is not merely about the stillness of inward turning for reasons of resignation, grief, or meditation. It also may include the outer symptoms of fight, agony, and violence. In his moment, in his, the moment of Caravaggio, as we, see, we shall see moment being the key both to violent and peaceful absorption, Michael Fried discusses at length Caravaggio's painting of Narcissus looking in the water just to be confronted with the reflection of his own image. 
The paradox of this painting is that it seems to represent the epitome of absorption, stillness in the extreme, while at the same time telling the gruesome story of someone metamor metamorphosized into a prisoner of his own self, stifled agony. That condition, as well as the resulting inner struggle, is made crystal clear by Narcissus literary creator Ovid. Oh, oh, I am he. I have felt it. I know now my own image. I burn with love of my own self. I both kindle the flames and suffer them. What shall I do? Shall I be wooed or woo? Why woo at all? What I desire I have. The very abundance of my riches beckers me. Oh, that I might be parted from my own body. And strange prayer for our love, I would that what I loved were absent from me. And now grief is sapping my strength, but a brief space of life remains to me, and I'm cut off in my life's prime. Book three, it is not book four. In Ovid's metamorph metamorph Metamorphosis, Narcissus soon dies, leaving in his stead only a flower, its yellow center girt with petals. As for Augustine, we can safely assume that he is not the inventor of the language of agony. Although leaning heavily on Paul for the execution of his ponderings, he knows Ovid's tormented language of love well enough also to be able to explore and shape the tormented language of grace. Yet, the question remains whether Augustine, like Caravaggio, succeeds in painting absorption of divided wills rather than playing out the theatricality of agony. That, in my view, Augustine does indeed succeed is precisely due to his handling of absorption, which puts him, in spite of his familiarity with Latin culture, more in Caravaggio's than Ovid's lead. Ovid narrates the story. Caravaggio paints the moment, the moment of Caravaggio. Or the mo it is my contention that Augustine paints the moment as well. Perhaps we have, to be, have been too wrong-footed by history's focus on the moment of conversion, represented by the picture of Augustine sitting under the fig tree with Paul's letters to the, Roman in fr uh, to the Romans in front of him, and the child's voice chanting, Tolle Lege, pick up and read, an undivided moment of double absorption. Be that as it may, that is not Augustine's moment of Caravaggio. Read as an isolated passage, it is theatrical to the core. But have we meanwhile forgotten that Augustine's Confessions is about confessing and staging the confessor confess, confess uninterruptedly? The confessing confessor. Like another Narcissus, Augustine has long since been imprisoned in his own confession. In terms of time, that means that each and every moment of confessing is tied up to the unseen and silent confessee whose intimidating yet absent presence is hovering over each and every confessional speech act. Forcing the confessor's memory out of the complacency of narrative suspense into the final coming out, coming out of oblivion into the present of presentness. To conclude this section, let me illustrate how Augustine, with the help of memory and time, brings about an absorption untainted by the dislocation and estrangement of theatricality, location and presentness being the key concepts here. Prior to the nadir of solitary despair, Augustine cries out to his friend Alipius, then, in the middle of that grand struggle in my inner house, which I had vehemently stirred up with my soul in the intimate chamber of my heart, I turned on Alipius and cried out, what is wrong with, uh, with us? What is this that you have heard? Uneducated people are rising up and capturing heaven. And we, with our high culture, without any heart, see where we roll in the mud of flesh and blood. Is it because they are ahead of us? 
that we are ashamed to follow? Do we feel no shame at making not even an attempt to follow? That is the gist of what I said, and the heat of my passion took my attention away from him as he contemplated my condition in astonished silence, for I sounded very strange. My uttered words said less about the state of my mind than my forehead, cheeks, eyes, color, and tone of voice are watching at the garden. If ever a writer succeeded in writing, writing a painting, it is Augustine in this scene. The gist of what I said, an expression Augustine tends to use when describing an, an ultimate experience, for instance in the vision at Ostia, creates room for putting in the spaciousness and perspective of painting, resulting in an almost still picture. Augustine, after first turning on Alypius with his outcry in order to next take his attention away from him as his friend contemplated his condition in astonished silence, you can see it, is nothing but action as stasis. All the painter has to do to intensify this picture is to bring agitated speech, what is wrong with us, to a halt and replace it pictorially with an image that freezes the scene on the spot. Alypius's astonished silence versus Augustine's forehead, cheek, eyes, color, tone, and voice turned away from his friend. Far from being theatrical, this is again stifled action, driven by a single dramatic imperative and closed in on itself. In the end, it is the confessional self-enclosure which prevents theatrical from creeping in. But what about the real drama that transfixes the reader, spectator? To discern the real drama, we should heed the markers of space and temporality, the intimate chamber of the heart, lifted up to the surface by the prolapses of our lodging at the garden. The garden of conversion mentioned long before the actual conversion takes place. For to, to get to that garden, the reader, ha the reader has to work his way through a good deal more uh, agonizing. And yet he knows that place already. This pictorial infrastructure of space is matched by temporality. Thus Augustine's outcry to his friend about the lagging behind where uneducated people rush in is part of the overall retardation, the not yet, not now, tomorrow, tomorrow, do we hear Eliot here? All of it seemingly the stuff of theatricality. But nothing is further from the truth. Spatial and spatial distension are overarched by the one single moment of time that governs past, future, and present, delay and acceleration. The present of the present, the, move, the moment of presentness that doesn't allow for one single break in the spatio-temporal act of confessing. As a result, we are compelled to face the moment that is a scene of overall absorption under whose wing singular scenes of high drama on the first of theatricality, such as Augustine versus Olympius, turn into absorbed pictures, driven by a single dramatic imperative. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. The second passage I want to discuss will bring up some more complications inside the notion of absorption. As, I, as I've used it so far. This time, we are dealing first and foremost with Augustine's friends, Alypius, whom we have met already in the previous passage, framed and focalized by confessing Augustine. Although at heart fond of the gladiatorial spe spectacles, Alypius claimed to detest that kind of theater, quite in line with his upbringing in ancient stoic philosophy, so um, characterized by self-control and self-reliance. What follows is a kind of pari, a private bet on Olympia's part that once he has allowed himself to be dragged to the theater by his friends, he could handle the situation and stay aloof. I shall be as one not there, and so I shall overcome both you and the games. So he boasts to his friends. He keeps his eyes shut but when a man falls in combat, 
his ears can't resist the roar of the crowd. And so he opens his eyes, losing his inner bat on the spot. As soon as he saw the blood, he at once drank in savagery and did not turn away. His eyes were riveted. He imbibed madness. Without any awareness of what was happening to him, he found delight in a murderous contest and was inebriated by bloodthirsty pleasure. He was not now the person who had come in, but just one of the crowd which he had joined and a true member of the group which had brought him. What should I add? He looked, he yelled, he was on fire. He took the madness home with him so that it urged him to return not only with those by whom he had originally been drawn there, but even more than them, um, taking others with them. In his classic study, my means is a representation of reality in Western literature. Erich Auerbach has highlighted the passage, this passage, this very passage, as an example of a budding realism which over and against the formal categorization of Roman and Greek literature emerged out of a Christian worldview to begin with the acknowledgement of a religious loss of self-control. True, Augustine doesn't betray his classical training as, for instance, in the triad, he looked, he yelled, he was on fire. Gone, however, is the unity of style to be replaced by Augustine's professional showing off his rhetorical skills on the one hand and his use of the sermon humilis, the low style, on the other. This low style in classical Latin used mainly in comedy, that is as close as one could get to ordinary language, is for Auerbach the vehicle to establish a direct approach to reality. In contrast to the classical authors, what we see in Alypius is the order of dramatic human struggle the text represents. Alypius is alive and fights. In comparison, the characters of pagan authors discussed by Auerbach in the previous passage are static shadows and reveal nothing of, li of a life within. Stylistically, the su suggestion of realism is shaped by the sustained use of the parataxis borrowed from bi biblical language. He opened his eyes, he was struck, he saw the blood, his eyes was riveted, were riveted, he imbibed madness <coughs> in Auerbach's view. And now I stop for a moment to have my... But you can read on, you know. So in Auerbach's view, this would be impossible in classical Latin. It is unquestionably the biblical form of parataxis, just as the content, the dramatization of an inner infant, an inner about face is avowedly Christian. He was not now the person who had come in, but just one of the crowd which he had joined. This is a sentence which in form as in content is unimaginable as a product of classical antiquity. It is Christian, and more specifically, Augustinian. For no one ever more passionately pursued and investigated the phenomenon of co conflicting and united inner forces, the alternation of antithesis and synthesis in their relations and effects. And he did so not only in practical context, as in our case, but also in connection with purely theoretical problems which under his hands becomes drama. There is no denying that we have a representation of reality here as announced in the subtitle of Auerbach's Mimesis. But where does that leave absorption? Auerbach himself leaves no doubt that for him realism and absorption coincide. The inner force is going out and the outer force is going in. In fact, throughout his tracing an increasing sense of realism in European literature, he doesn't stop at the 19th century realistic novel, but at the epitome of absorption and soliloquy, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. In my view, Auerbach is to be recommended for this daring conclusion of realism's metallization. But why 
don't we feel entirely at ease with calling this exceedingly realistic scene of Olypius' immersion into the theater a folk day? Why do we still feel some distance from Inspector Moses' Good Night Ladies and Elias to Carthage I came, burning, burning? Not because of the violence as opposed to resignation, which in the case of Olypius is no less scenic than Caravaggio's David and Goliath and the beheading of John the Baptist, or even the conversion of St. Paul, falling from his horse. Yeah. Somehow in Alba's reading, the excess seems too direct, adding paradoxically a touch of theatricality to an absorptive scene. Let me illustrate this gap as I feel it with a scene from Colm Toynbee's novel, Brooklyn. An Irish girl, all on her own in Brooklyn, starts going out with a gentle Italian boy, no macho at all, who persuades her to join him and his brothers for once to attend the game with the Dodgers playing. The, d the brothers warn the girl in advance. In the theater of the game, this gentle boy will change altogether. And so it happens. Once the game starts, it's, it is all excitement and shouting and cheering. The boy, Tony, is wrapped, I quote, wrapped up in the game, ignoring his girl altogether, leaning over her to have a better view. Yet, the girl somehow experiences this seizing of attention for her as reassuring rather than alarming. Tony was so wrapped up in the game that it gave her a chance to let her thoughts linger on him, flow toward him, noting how different he was from her in every way, the idea that he would never see her as he felt she saw him now came to her as an infinite relief, a satisfactory solution to things. What a splendid double absorption. The one all outward bound framed by the other in the guise of a soliloquy. Perhaps Toybin, who like most if not all Irish men of letters knows his Augustine, finishes where off where our bus stops thus removing any possible, possible taint of theatricality. But so does Augustine. It is not enough to hear his condemning voice as a subauditor in describing the theatrical downfall of his friend Alypius. Surely describing is the wrong word here, for that would mean an interruption of the confessor confessing. So if he were to paint this scene, Alypius' absorption would not suffice. In one way or another, it should include the confessor as well. Not ostentatiously, with pen in hand, but like the quiet Irish girl sitting behind the back of her shouting friend, ignoring and leaning over him, absorbed in his overall confession. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. In conclusion, we have to face the question, where does all this leave the reader, listener, observer. As we have seen, Fried himself admits to the insolvability of the problem by on the one hand defining absorption in the strongest possible terms as the supreme fiction uh, of ontological illusion that the beholder does not exist, that there is no, no one standing before the canvas, and on the other hand, keeping open the possibility of the absorbed painting arresting the actual beholder before the work, and indeed as transfixing him or her with a new identity. This distinct, uh, distinction is not as absolute as it seems. The fact that in the first option, the observer severed from the painting is an illusion, doesn't mean that the transfixed beholder of the second option is a fact. Let us momentarily return then to the kernel of Diderot's anti-theatrical sorry anti-theatrical stance, as described by Fried in its wider implication. A clear quote. But it seems clear that starting around the middle of the 18th century in France, the beholder's presence before the painting became increasingly to be conceived by critics and theorists as something that had to be accomplished or at least powerfully affirmed by the painting itself. 
like Obama, the thought of the Night Watch. Historically circumscribed, as this the Diderotian criticism may be, Fried is too passionate about its implication to be able to stop his meditations then and there. As he can't leave Caravaggio alone, he, he traces the problem of absorption and anti-theatricality even further into his great passion, modernist art. Thus, in his essay, Art and Object Wood, he takes modern theatrical art to task, accusing it of catering to the space and time of the observer, a stance that can only end in what he calls literalism, that is, object objecthood stifling in time, the duration of experience that precisely that's precisely what theatrical theatricality is about. For free, that means handling the art objects in a literalist fashion, indulging the latter that kills. This literalism stands in contrast to modernist art because there are at every moment the work itself, because there at every moment the work itself is wholly manifest. I want to claim, Fried continues, that, is that it is by virtue of their presentness and, and instantaneousness that modernist painting and sculpture defeat theater. Taking our leave of Fried, let us have one last look at Augustine. Of course, in his case, the denial of readership or audience would seem fully counterintuitive. And although in my view, we do have to act counterintuitively in approaching Augustine. We can only do so after having confirmed that the magic of his rhetoric is fully in place, and that, as Catherine Conybeare has put it so nicely, Confessions is a work social to the core and, above all, a song. But who is the listener to this worthy song? Who is the observer of this absorbed painting? Who is confessionally speaking up to following the confessor? If we stay loyal to Augustine, it can't be anyone indiscriminately. It has to be a reader who, before being able to read, due to absorption's presence inside the book and its author, is cut off by the book, severed by the painting. In Augustinian terms, it has to be a non-Pelagian reader, someone that is, who is capable of leaving the confessor alone in order to make room for the presentness of soliloquy and absorption. Surely, since non-Pelagian means non-literalist and non-theatrical, this picture of the reader standing for the door, waiting to catch the right confessional moment to get inside, doesn't make for easy reading. Or, as Fried puts it, we are all literalists, most or all of our lives. Presentness is grace. If, however, that moment happens to be come true, the reader, rather than blitzing gaps between text and self, is transfixed so as to take in Lala, to Carthage, then I came, burning, 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 burning. O Lord, thou pluckest me out, O Lord, thou pluckest, burning. Thank you. Come to you. I'm, I'm pretty dead, so. Yeah. Um, thank you for thank you very much for your talk. I'm yes. sure you enjoyed thinking about it some more. Um, I wonder if I might ask you to comment some more about Olypius as an illustration of the things that you've been speaking about. Um, something that caught my eye uh, at the end of the passage um, uh, about his being a spectator um, at the uh, 
the, the gladiatorial games. Um, he came back with more people than he went with before. Mm -hmm. So he wanted um, the, this being engrossed as he was in, in, the, in the site, he wanted more people to be in it with him. Um, and yet, as you were speaking towards the end about someone who's ready to let someone to be al alone, at least in a certain respect, um, and you compare this to what, a, what, the, what the reader of the confessions ought to be, um, uh, if, I, if, I, if I followed you correctly, that reminded me of Olypius in the garden, who is ready to accompany Augustine, but not be too involved um, at the crucial moment. Um, and so I wonder if this, it, it just suggested to me that there might be a kind of um, uh, growth in Olypius, uh, and I, I leave this to you to come on top, but yes, I just, uh, I, I, wonder, I wonder if the, this uh, at all illustrates any of that you're speaking about. Yes, I see what you mean, but I meant something slightly different. For now, you, uh, you are doing something we, we really, all of us can't resist, is taking this scene of, uh, of, Lip uh, of Olympias as a story in its own right, you see. And what I'm trying to, to, to emphasize is that there is no moment um, Augustine is uh, out of sight because he is confessing, even writing, writing about his, his friend about, uh, and about the, <coughs> sorry, about the astonished silence of his friend. It is Augustine who is shaping it not only in a modern sense so as, a, as a writer, an author, but as a confessor. So what I want, the point I want to make is really that there is mo no moment in reading it in the, conf the confessions, and that's but, uh, what I mean by reading it in a non-Palatian uh, manner. Uh, there's no moment you can leave uh, Augustine out. And that's why I try to, to freeze this scene almost you know, into a picture, and also why I made the, um, the comparison also in the with the uh, Comtoibin, you know, the, uh, just as the girl is uh, almost absent, she's in, she's framing the scene. So Augustine is framing the scene of violence uh, with regard to Olympias, you see. So you, uh, every, every step you take in reading means a step back to, to not to, to a romantic, uh, uh, subject subject of, of the author, but to the confessor. That's the limit. Mm. You see? I think that helps me. Thank you. Yeah. Alan. Yeah. Uh, it almost seems to me that the, the image that holds your talk in some ways together yeah. is, is the, the story at the Brooklyn Dodgers game. Yeah. Where the um, the young man has come become so completely absorbed yeah. in something else. Like there's Olympias. actually a relationship happening. Yeah. And the paradox of picking up a book like the Confessions and yeah. thinking it's enough to read it yeah. and you will understand it um, is somehow not true because you, you need to, to see, like the young woman, um, the complete absorption yeah. in yeah, the yeah. Confessions. Yes, and, and a double absorption, I, I, I argue. Yes, I, I agree with you. It's a very good point. I was struck by this passage. I thought, I, 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 you know, uh, the, the book happened to be in the house, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> this, this is a Tolle Lake kind of, you know. I, I read it, and I was, I was really, uh, I liked the book, and I was, I was really struck by this passage. For I had trouble in solving the confessional problem in analyzing this passage on Olypius. Because I thought, where is Augustine? And then I, I got to this passage from Kolb, in Kolbing, at, uh, um, uh, Kontoibin, and you know, I saw that the girl was there absent, but present, and, and she framed the scene because you, know, you see through her eyes the absorption of, the, of her friend. Like, and the, the friend is like Olypius you know, uh, involved, absorbed into the games. But she is like Augustine, the author, 
a thought uh, in thinking about uh, the boy. And, and a very, very, uh, that's not, not in the confessions, of course, but I also thought that psychologically this was very subtle, that she, she was resigned to, to go on with this boy, not, not something in spite of his uh, liking the games, you know, and not because she would ever like the games, but in a kind of neutral, uh, non-romantic acceptance of life. And yeah. a willingness not yeah. to have to analyze yeah. every action yeah, yeah. in relationship to me. Yes, and that's what, what uh, I think that that's what Fried puts very nicely. Fried is not a religious man at all, not a Christian, <laughs> uh, that he's a presentness. It is presentness, and that's grace. You know, it's a grace, moment of grace. Fascinating way to think about theology without the jargon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the jargonistic way we take a word is simply grace. Yes, well, that's interesting in uh, in uh, Fried's, uh, for he's writing about modern art of all things, you know. So in the, uh, he doesn't mean grace in a religious sense, but he has been much attacked for this grace, you know. It has, well, for his views in, in, uh, in general. So he, uh, he can't complain about that, you know. He got the attention he, uh, he wanted. But uh, for you, so putting it that way, mm -hmm. people were rather amazed. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm drawing from, from your comment that um, what's simultaneously at stake here is what, what, I, what I don't want to call a, a method or a mindset, because it's precisely the interruption of that, but a, a, a method of reading or uh, of approaching a text like this, where we, in a sense, have to be transfixed yes. as the audience in, yeah. in, in, in the very absorption yeah, that yeah. We're, we're beholden. And it, it yeah. seems to me that there are, and um, I, I don't really have a question, it just seems, uh, I guess my question is, is, is that also at stake? Is, is yes, it, it is, stake certainly at stake, yeah, yeah. And it is at stake in, in the shape, uh, as, as uh, Freak admits, of a dilemma that can't be solved. Yeah. For you know, a, an absorptive painting mm -hmm. leaves out the, 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 the observer, mm -hmm. the spectator. But uh, you know, it is a, um, uh, it's a faux semblant, you know, it, is a, it, it, is, it seems for, uh, to be the way, you know, it is, it is playing with it a bit. For of course, you're standing before that, uh, uh, you know, a spectator is standing before the painter, but not in this theatrical sense that the anything goes, and, and that's what I meant by the non-Pelagian uh, way of reading or looking, mm -hmm. you know, then that's being transfixed, right. not in a romantic way, but quite, quite also in an art historical or artistic way, quite uh, on the spot, quite literally, or although he is against literalism, but you see what I mean. Yeah, I see that's how that's the only way of reading. It asks, it requires a, a stance, you see. Right, and I see how that would totally I interrupt all the baggage you see yeah. that, that we approach Ag Augustine with, that yes, have these yeah. interpretations for centuries, that it totally interrupts that. In a, in yes, a and that was my point in the, uh, w which I listed, you know, in the different uh, aspects present in the, uh, in, the in the confessions, which are all true, mm -hmm. but uh, you can't bring them together. And I was looking for, not for uh, something absolute, you know, um, this is just an attempt, of course, and uh, you know, another person can make another attempt. Mm -hmm. But um, I was looking for some notion that would uh, hold together all those different aspects and uh, turn, them, turn them around from being factual kinds of things to, well, assortive, living, living things, uh, presently. Well, you have to talk louder. Yeah. Is it possible to experience that grace of the present that you're picking up on from Freed in the case of reading Augustine if we are not ourselves drawn into Augustine's confession by, in some sense, making a confession of our own? In other words, it, in the case of being transfixed by a painting that absorbs us in its absorption, um, in the case of reading Augustine, can we be transfixed by his confessional absorption 
without, in some sense, being called to confess ourselves. Does that, does that make sense? Now, Stephen, then it relates to your question yeah. about, uh, and then uh, <coughs> I, 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 I admit immediately that the Esprit admits, you know, with regard to us, is to he is to blame the, the, uh, the problem of the dog, that the problem can't be solved, you see. But um, there are different aspects in it that are coming together. First of all, I think you have, you know, uh, take the art historical example, looking at an absorbed painting, like the, uh, the woman reading of Rembrandt or the, the Augustine preaching. You know, you have, as a spectator, you have to acknowledge the absorption, as in Cavellian, uh, Stanley Cavell. I uh, read this very much influenced by Stanley Cavell, you know, by the philosophy. So all this uh, epistemological stuff comes from Cavell. And that would be, would in terms of Cavell, that would be acknowledgement. Um, you and that's what I meant by saying you have to leave him alone first. Otherwise, you can't draw a line, uh, or even though the line is imaginary. You see, it is not a real line. Of course, if you're standing before the painting, and once you're standing before it, or reading the book, and once you read it, there's a relationship. But yet, uh, still, you have, to have, you have to have it alone. O otherwise, you can't be transfixed. You know, that requires distance at first. Leave that fellow alone and uh, creating his absorption. Otherwise, you never get to getting the absorption. And that means you would never get to getting absorbed yourself. And that's what I uh, then mean by non-palation, you see, by grace. Thank you. I have a question. I thought that was yeah, yeah. I thought that was amazing. And I thought you you